Open your mouth and bless the Lord, everybody. With your eyes closed and your hands lifted, open your mouth, lift your voice. His presence is in this place. Make sure you participate in the worship. Worship the King of Kings, the Lord of hosts, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Don't let someone else worship for you. Raise your hands to him, lift your voice, magnify his name. Let him hear you in your own words, through your own language. Worship your maker, worship your provider, worship your sustainer, the one who has given you life, the one who is life indeed. Come on, raise your hands and give him glory. Man of God, woman of God, raise your hands and adore him. We bless you, Jesus. Arabahasito roboko semenahai. You can bless him in the spirit. You can bless him in your understanding. Mando robe Jesus prende vera ha crapale ze malusia. Prata la maroke semendo robo si atala. We give you glory. We exalt your name. We adore you. We bless you. We love you. We love you, Jesus. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Jesus. Hallowed be God of majesty, divine authority, hallowed be Lord, we bless you tonight. We honor you. We adore you. We worship you in the beauty of holiness. We stand in awe of you. We stand in awe of your presence. Your presence is our life. Your presence is the very air that we breathe. We acknowledge you, Lord. We thank you. What a privilege to be called your sons and daughters. And we thank you for what you will do tonight. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' name. Is it okay for us to pray for five minutes? God is set to do something new in your life tonight. That's why you came. And I assure you that if your heart is open tonight, you will not miss God. And you will not leave this place the same. I would want you to pray in the next five minutes. And I want you to pray with every passion and every aggression that you have. And ask the Lord for an encounter tonight. That you will not just hear the word of God and go. But let there be a definite experience that you will have with God tonight. That will transform and change your life forever. Every time God gathers his children, he gathers them because... There is something he's about to do in their midst and in their lives. But they must be ready to believe. The Bible says, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Now every time you truly believe God, your actions will show. So in the next five minutes, forget about who is around you. If you have ever prayed before, I want you to cry to God and say, Lord, give me an encounter tonight. This is why I came. Lift your voice, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Please make sure you're praying everywhere. Make sure you're praying. It doesn't matter whatever you're doing in the service, make sure you're praying tonight. 
ask him for an encounter. Come on, lift your voice, saints of God, pray. Zuprehetimenos Barato Zembrahatamando Skofaliata. Oh, God is going to touch someone tonight. God is going to speak to someone tonight. Shida Barahate Miroklo Habaskima. Read up on me, bread of God. Read up on me. Spirit of the Lord, as I lift my hands in surrender to your will, O oh Lord, I'm yielding to your spirit, I'm working in your Lord. Just pray. Jesus, I adore. Oh, Jesus, I adore. Jesus, I adore. Your Lord. Do something new in my life. Something Shapa, <laughs> <laughs> 
Jesus Son of God, you are so good, Almighty God, hallowed be your name, your dominion is forevermore. Son of God, you are so good. We say, Oh, my God, I love be your name. started thank you for the lives that you will transform thank you for burdens that you will lift thank you for healing that will come to your people thank you for the power the intoxicating power of your word that will impregnate someone's spirit tonight let your great name be forever praised in jesus great name we pray Shout a big amen to Jesus. Shout a louder and louder amen. Clap your hands. Give God praise. I said give God praise. I said give God a big hand and shout of praise. Hallelujah. Are you excited to be here tonight? God, God will do you good tonight. In Jesus' mighty name. Take your seat in the presence of God quickly. We will go straight into the word. Tonight is going to be amazing and exceptional. I came with a word for someone tonight. And I believe that someone will open his or her heart and receive that word with faith. 
It is the word of God that is capable of changing, of transforming. And it's also the word of God that can shift you from where you are to where God wants you to be. Nothing lifts, nothing transfers, nothing shifts, nothing imparts as powerful as the word of God. And someone will experience a change in destiny tonight in Jesus' name. For those of us that are following online and for every one of us that are here today, I welcome you to Pneumatech. May the Lord honor you for coming in Jesus' name. Can we celebrate the worship team? Thank you so much for that powerful rendition. Amen. God bless you. And truly God is calling us deeper. And I pray that God will stir up hunger for him in the heart of somebody tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friend is here again, Pastor David John. God bless you. Please give him a big hand. Big hand. Thank you. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Amen. We are so blessed by God that you are here again. Thank you so much, sir, for coming. His kind of work allows him to travel up and down. And I'm grateful to God that we are together here again. Amen. Are you ready for the word tonight? How many of you are excited when the word of God comes? I don't know about you, but <laughs> I don't know about you, but listen, I don't know about you, but every time the word of God comes to me, whether in a service like this or in my private time of prayer or studies, there is an excitement that it does. There's something it triggers inside of me. I used to think I was abnormal. But later on, I found other people like myself. So that means that if that doesn't happen to you, you are the one that is abnormal. You understand what I'm saying? Jeremiah said, I found your words and I ate them. And they were the joy and rejoicing. The word of God is the greatest treasure. That's all that he left us. Please look for the scripture for me. I think it is Deuteronomy 32 or 33. Where he speaks about... Um, God leaving us a law he, he left us an inheritance And a law Something like that Just look for that scripture It just flashed in my mind right now I want to show you something very powerful All that God has left you Your greatest asset as a believer Is the word of God I'm telling you It's not the car that you can drive Material, financial acquisitions Thank God that those things are obtainable in Christ Jesus all right and you see for baby christians respectfully speaking it is important for them to know that one of the reasons why jesus died was for them to be freely given all of these things for them to know that god has already supplied their needs in christ jesus it is good and important for a baby christian to know that but as you mature in the faith you begin to go into higher things higher dealings with God and you begin to lay hold of the things that truly matter the things that are important you will realize that all of these material things that we can have on earth are but temporal and then your soul begins to hunger for that which is eternal to lay hold of that inheritance if you can't find the scripture it's okay we'll, 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 we'll get it another day but I really wanted to show you something. All that God has left us, your inheritance in Christ, is this word. Everything that you will receive is in his word. Second Peter chapter 1 in verse 3. He says, according as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge. Somebody say knowledge. Through the knowledge of him who has called us into glory and virtue. The word of God is your greatest asset. Don't allow the devil fool you. May there not be any time. Oh, he has gotten the scripture. Thank you very much. Deuteronomy 32. No, no, that's not the scripture. It talk, it, there's inheritance and law in that scripture. Inheritance and law. I think it's chapter 32 or 33. Something like that. You can get it for us. 
don't allow the devil fool you to any time to believe that aside from the word of God there are things you need to get no everything that you will receive in Christ Jesus and your conformity your growth conforming to the image of God which is in Christ Jesus is in the word of God so you will rate your level of growth as a believer your level of transformation by how much knowledge and understanding of scripture you interface with part-time the Bible calls it the true riches are you hearing me don't you allow the devil deceive you at any time at any time you know most times the enemy plays this card with us that brings us to the flesh when it seems like you are deprived of certain things you are believing God for and it tarries it doesn't seem like it's coming the enemy begins to play us one kind of game that gets us trapped in the flesh and we truly begin to esteem the riches of this life far better than the eternal word of God the Bible says the word of God liveth and abideth forever it's the only thing that doesn't change but it changes you are you hearing me a few millions in your account and then you realize that <laughs> you you now know whether you truly love God or not so you see that physical circumstances are temporal they can subject you to changes but you can never have enough of the Word of God put that last scripture that's the scripture put it there the last one it said Moses commanded a law for us King James please Moses commanded us a law even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob the law is his word and the Bible is calling it our inheritance is somebody getting me this afternoon that's your inheritance how would Jesus die and all that you will receive is a car and a house and of what use would that death be if it was to lay hold on material and natural things I'm, I'm healing somebody tonight oh, so that your hunger nothing would change your hunger and desire for the word of God so no matter how much you have or how less in this life your greatest treasure is his word he said commanded us in law even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob when Abraham was to, you know, his last days on earth, the Bible says in Genesis 25 that he gave gifts to his other sons. You know, Abraham got married to another woman, all right, called Keturah. The Bible says he gave gifts. I think that's chapter 25, verse 5 and 6. In verse 5, he says he gave all to Isaac. All he had, he gave to Isaac. But in verse 6, he says he gave gifts to the other ones. So if he gave all to Isaac, where were those gifts? simply speaking he gave his material possessions to the other sons you take car you take moto take house take this one just take and go but when he was isaac he said i won't give you material things there's something i can give you the bible called it the blessing the blessing is the spoken the prophetically spoken word of god to an individual every time a revelation of god's word come to you the blessing has come to you so you have the ability to lay hold of your inheritance which is eternal in Christ it is that inheritance that can translate into all the physical things you have, you can have and even to spiritual resources are you hearing what I'm saying even the anointing that God will release to you is in his word the day you find it by revelation you step into it and the Bible says the gifts and callings of God are without I want to raise by the help of God a generation of Christians yes they are wealthy yes they are excellent but those who truly love God and who esteem the Word of God a far greater treasure to their lives and their existence than any other thing So every time you open your scriptures, every time you open the Bible, the scriptures, or every time you are listening to the word of God, you are interacting with your inheritance. So you listen with attention. What will make you what God wants you to be is not the things you have. No, those things are a derivative of what you have received from the world. You know, there are things you are not supposed to chase in this life. One of it is money. 
The Bible says money answereth all things. Bishop, if I call you answer, Bishop, sir. Money answereth. So there's something that can come on your life that will make money. So you don't live in depression simply because you don't have Naira and Kobo now, you don't have dollars. Where, where, where did you and last day church? If only God can open your eyes to see the treasure that is in scripture. For instance, you can locate a promise in the word of God. And the day you believe it, it becomes yours forever. He said, Moses left us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation. Whether they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord or not, he has given it to them as an inheritance forever. So, begin to train your appetites. The Bible says, set your hearts or your minds on things above, not on things below. All of these things are only to make life comfortable for your physical body that is here, because that's the house. And then so that you can have time to pursue the things that are greater. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Most of the people who chase money, they don't, they don't get it actually. Ask the poor. I said ask the poor because I'm not poor. By the grace of God. I can't be poor. I know too much of the world to be poor. Are you hearing me? I can't be poor. There's nothing you have physically that can intimidate. I can admire any most. I can admire what you have. <laughs> but it doesn't stand a chance with what I carry in my spirit. I'm talking about something that can change a generation. Something that can light the lamp of a territory. How many billions can buy that one? You need to, you need to place value on yourself and what you carry. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I don't know why I'm going this route. Maybe God is addressing somebody. For one whole week you have been thinking because you didn't have any money in your account. And you are just frustrated or because you don't have a job and all of that. No, cheer up. There's something you have inside of you. If you think it's not important, why did the devil offer Jesus the whole world for that thing? You think about it. All these kingdoms and everything will I give to you. I just need one thing from you. If you think it's not important. Is that well said? Can we go to the word now? Put, put your hands on your, on your belly. And I want you in one minute, talk to yourself and tell yourself how valuable you are because of the treasures of the word of God that is inside of your spirit. I won't tell you what to say. You say it to yourself. The Bible says what we have, the Bible calls it wisdom. He says it is more precious than rubies. He said, it is greater than silver and gold. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You need to do that every day. You need to do that every day. Until you begin to lay hold of that which God has invested in you in Christ Jesus. Are you ready tonight? First Peter chapter 2 verse 4 to 5 Someone's destiny will open up tonight Okay, let me talk to my online people These guys, I don't know where they are They are still sleeping I'm talking to those who are following online Somebody's destiny will open up tonight Somebody will mark today's date As your birthday Listen not because you don't have it that what you have is physical birthday but there's a revelation coming to you today and it will be like oh my god have i been alive before now because of what is about to come to you somebody will lay hold of something and there's something inside of you will be born tonight i know what i'm telling you are you ready tonight 
I can't hear you. Are you ready? First Peter chapter 2 verse 4. Please be seated. First Peter chapter 2 verse 4 to 5. But you can go to New King James. Go back to New King James now. Ooh, I'm so excited already. I'm telling you, something is going to happen to someone tonight. Coming to him as to a living stone. Rejected indeed by men. But chosen by God and precious. He said, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. Now there is a paradox contained a paradoxical statement is contained in these two verses and it is two words put together living stones. Well those of you who are well read in English language know that a paradox is simply when you are bringing two opposite things together. I believe. Is it a paradox or an oxymoron? I don't know. I think so. No, I speak in tongues. That's my native language. Amen. English language is for those in United Kingdom. My own language is tongues. Say amen. Well, but I'm using English language, so I think living stones these are two opposite words living stones because a stone is dead a stone has no life a stone can produce nothing is that true yet the bible speaks of living stones go back to verse 4 there's a statement after this phrase that best explains why you have these two words together. Coming to him as to a living stone. And then the next statement explains why you have those two opposite words together in one statement. It's a rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. Just the way it is impossible for a stone to be alive. That is the way that the writer of this passage wants you to comprehend. That though you were rejected by men, yet you were chosen by God. How can something be or someone be rejected by God's most priced creation? God's most important creation. Reject something or someone, but God accepts it. Man is supposed to be the crowning work of God's creation. The greatness and the excellence of God's expertise and wisdom was supposed to be exemplified in the creation called man. And remember in the Bible, the Bible says in Genesis 2 that God brought all the animals to Adam. You would think that God wanted Adam's opinion. Not really. It was just a test. When you fabricate or when you manufacture a vehicle, there are tests you will subject it to. I was told, or I, I, you know, I, I heard somewhere, that when Mercedes-Benz produce their car, the engine, they keep it to run non-stop for 1,000 hours. So all they do is put oil, why is running, put oil, put grease, all those things you need to put. It has to run for 1,000 hours. To certify the strength, the dynamic, and the longevity, the long, the long, you know, the long-lasting nature or durability of that engine. Maybe that's why there are two kinds of cars. Well, let's leave that. <laughs> Amen. So it was a test. God was not looking for man's opinion. No, it was a test. He created man in his image and after his likeness. Let's test and see if it was truly done as I wanted. 
and he brought the animals to man to see what he will call them and whatever name adam gave them that was their name in other words god wanted to test to see if man really thought like him remember that something left god to adam in genesis 2 verse 7 the bible calls it the breath of life in other words the <laughs> oh god what do i use now the foundation of the existence of anything that is living when you say breath of life breath is what everything that is living needs to live isn't it to exist so when he said breath of life it was not just breath into his nostrils but he gave him the definition of existence not just to man but to all that he had created that was why out of man came the definition of the purpose of everything created i hope i'm not too big for you yet the bible says that there is someone or something that this man that was supposedly perfectly created by god there is something that men would despise and reject go back to our text the bible says you are living stones new king james please coming to him as to a living stone rejected indeed by men but chosen by god and precious next verse he said you also as living stones so jesus christ was the first example that's what you see in verse 4 he was rejected of men the bible says so in isaiah chapter 53 in verse 4 that he is despised of men he was afflicted right verse 3 rather it says he is despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief yet he was chosen by god he was chosen as the one that will bring that will restore the great divide between god and man now the bible says in first peter where we are reading in verse 5 that we also being creatures in the image of christ jesus just the way jesus was one time rejected by men which led to his death but he was chosen by god the bible says you too you will come to him as living stones in verse 5 and that you are being built up a spiritual house a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god through jesus christ ephesians chapter 2 another scripture do about two or three scriptures and then we'll go into the teaching today ephesians chapter 2 from verse 1 he says and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins remember we are coming from living stones isn't it and i told you that a stone is dead so if the bible is speaking of a particular kind of stone that is alive as it has explained to us that we were rejected by men but chosen by god that means that a living stone is some is something that was dead and rejected by men but has been chosen by god and is alive or made alive by the spirit of course this stone is not talking about your literal stone it's talking about you and i that by the rejection of men we were left for dead anything that is is not uh, uh serving its purpose or anything that is not useful to those who are living is as good as dead isn't it uh -huh. so by the rejection of men by the despising of men you were also reckoned as dead but god chose you and because of that he has made you alive by his spirit that is what redemption and salvation best explains for us back to ephesians he said and you he made alive that means you were dead what kind of death he said who were dead in trespasses because of the nature of sin in us we were good as dead we were separated from the life of god there was no use your life had no use to eternity 
or to God. Left for dead, but the Bible says he made you alive. This is the work of salvation. In trespasses and sins. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. In which you once walked according to the cause of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit who now walks in the sons of disobedience. That was our allotment before Jesus died. He says, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh. Used to doing what you want, what you like, how you want. Or subjected under sin. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature children of wrath. Just as the others. You know what that sentence means? When it says by nature you were children of wrath. It means we were condemned for destruction. Every time God wants to destroy in scripture. He will release his wrath. When the Bible says we were children of wrath. It means we were condemned for destruction. That was how good we were. And in that state, certain people neglected you, rejected you, despised you. They said nothing good will come out of you. But go to the next verse. He said, but God. I love, I love but in scripture. Anytime you see but in scripture, it always, almost always has something good for his children. He said, but God, who is rich in mercy... Because of his great love with which he loved us. Go on. Even when you were dead in trespasses, he said he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Go on. We are reading down to verse 10. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Somebody should have said amen to that. Seems you weren't following the, the reading. Go back. Let me read it again. He said, and raised us up together. Not only did he make us alive, he raised us up. From whatever pit that life has kept you in. He raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's nothing more honorable than that, I'm telling you. Would you rather that than be a senator of the Federal Republic of Nigeria? Of a government that will end when the government of his kingdom comes. The Bible says in Revelations that the kingdom of his world has become the kingdom of our God. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. In Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. I like it in message translation. I think in message translation it says we are his masterpiece. Right? Is that what he has there? Okay. Maybe it's another scripture. And uh, sorry, another translation. One translation says, We are his masterpiece. Go back to New King James. Wait, we'll go back to this your message. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's correct. Go back to New King James now. Let's read verse 10. He said, For we are his workmanship, his tools, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That means God created you as an implement, as a tool, as a machine, as a device. You know the Bible speaks of the devices of the enemy. But we are now God's devices and he forged us for good work. That there is a work he will do with us and through our lives. The Bible says that he had prepared before time that we would walk in them. That means God created you to use you to display a dimension of his glory that is not seen. That's what he said in the verses ahead, uh, before. He says that in the ages to come, there's something that your life will create under the masterpiece of God, under the architecture of God. Something that the world has never seen. Apostle, even in this, my poverty, you hold on. That poverty came in time. It was not so in eternity. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? He was the king of kings, but in time, temporarily, he was the son of a carpenter. Did that stop him from fulfilling destiny? All right. Created in Christ Jesus. Somebody say, I'm created for good works. Those of you that have babies, touch your baby and say, you were created for good works. for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them go to verse 19 and 20 now let's finish up verse 19 and 20 now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God you now see why it calls us living stones because I did a research recently and I discovered one of the uh, uh, one of the best forms of um, architectural design for building are stones, you know, using stones to build. If you go to some developed countries like the United Kingdom and the rest, you will see walkways, streets, pavements, even buildings that some of them have been standing a hundred years, a hundred and fifty years, two hundred years. Why? They were made of stones. I actually did a research on stone and I discovered that stone is fireproof. Termites cannot eat it. They cannot melt. It conditions the environment, the weather within the house, whether it is rainy or it is sunny. So in those days, Stones were the best, you know, form of blocks that were used to build. The Bible says that we are members of the household of God. So every one of us as living stones, we are brought together to make a building that the Bible calls the household of God. It means that we are brought together to become a dwelling place for God. That's what it says in the next verse, verse 20 there. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And if you read down to verse 22, it talks about we, you know, the whole building fitted together, built up for a habitable place of the Spirit of God. So we have been brought together. That's why we are called the body of Christ. Every one of us come together. And in the Spirit, we are likened to a building in which the spirit of god which is the life of god dwells and resides not only does he reside in us when we come together but he resides in every one of us that's why we are called living stones because the spirit of life dwells in you a stone that has been made alive in salvation so every one of us are living stones because we carry the life of the spirit of god in us and when we come together we become a habitable structure for God to dwell in. It is important that you understand the metaphor building when it's describing Christians. Because a building project happens phase by phase. So don't give up on God wherever you are now at, in life. This is just one phase of the building. Please. Go back to verse 20. From verse 20 to 22, I want to show you something powerful. <laughs> In whom all the building fitly framed together grow wet. He didn't say that it has been finished. The building is still on. Concerning your destiny, concerning your life. The project is still on. Grow it into an holy temple in the Lord. Go on, verse 22. In whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. If you are with me, say amen. amen. The title of my message tonight, Living Stones. Another scripture, and then we'll proceed. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5 to 6. So we are God's building. Living stones made alive in Christ Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost. 
that means that we are we were rejected by men but we are now useful to god and so useful are we to god that god decided to make us his habitation his dwelling place not his car park not his stable for his horses no there are horses in heaven okay. <laughs> he made us his building not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves somebody pay attention to this scripture not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves but our sufficiency somebody scream the last three words one to go i can't hear you our sufficiency is of who so in yourself you are insufficient and you know it is good that you have that understanding it doesn't make you feel depressed it doesn't make you work with low self-esteem is a reality so if people insult you based on an insufficiency they see they are right if they are referring to just you because we are sufficient not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves but our sufficiency is of god go on who also had made us able ministers of the new testament somebody say able ministers he has made us he put his ability in us and it is by that ability that we can bring to birth and cause to bring forth the purpose of god divinely ordained for our lives not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter kill it but the spirit give it light Many years ago, I was studying this scripture and I looked up several translations. I can't seem to find that particular translation now, years later. But you will not believe that the translation, where you say we are ministers, the translation uses the word dispensers. How many of you know a water dispenser? What do you do with a water dispenser? You get water out of it. Now, with modern day water dispensers, you can put ordinary water there but you can get water in different temperatures hot or cold or warm he said who has made us oh you got this you got it dispensers that's it amplified it is he who has qualified us making us to be fit and worthy and sufficient as ministers and dispensers my god there's something that your life there's a cargo that your life carries that is meant to offload every time people come around you you say my apostle i've not seen anything that's because you've not known dispensers so his ability in us makes us to dispense that life the Bible calls it the life of the spirit that brings God to the scene and we can display it in any dimension just like a dispenser can give you hot water cold water warm water he has made us dispensers that through our lives the world will see the love of God through our lives the world will also see the justice and judgment of God through our lives the world will see the power of God through our lives the world will also see the endurance and patience of god i don't know if i'm talking to somebody this afternoon not of the letter of legally written code but of the spirit for the code of the law kills but the holy spirit makes alive and that's why we are called living stones despised and rejected of men as stones but chosen by god and made alive by his spirit we are living stones that means that your life on earth here was a very specific part of the design of god's plan it was not by accident
believe what I'm telling you. You didn't come here by accident. It doesn't matter how you came. There are many couples trying to get pregnant that they can't get pregnant. So don't say because you were born out of wedlock, you are a mistake. No, you are not a mistake. I'm speaking against that voice that has been speaking in your mind for a long time. Maybe you came from a polygamous home. Or you came from a poverty-stricken home. You were not a mistake. The circumstances surrounding your coming does not affect your eternal purpose. He made you a living stone. And a stone is used for building. So he didn't bring you on this earth to waste your time. No. He brought you on a definite assignment. That is the more reason why you should believe that you will be alive. Regardless of what the devil throws at you. Are you, are you here? Living stones. Living stones. Now, let me talk to us briefly about what I call basic facts of God's dealings with man. Basic facts of God's dealings with men. It is important that we know how God deals with men. Very, very important. Because the perception of your life and how you will live and exist, how you will function on earth, is based on the perception you have of your life. And for you to truly understand your life, you need to understand how God deals with men. Because God created man. Many Christians suffer today all kinds of things in the hand of the devil generally because they don't understand God's dealings with men. So sometimes when they seem trapped in a particular situation, they think God has forgotten them. That's why the Bible says that the ways of God are past finding out. It cannot be comprehended. So it is as we grow and walk with God for Christians who are serious about walking with God, developing a relationship with God, and knowing God. I'm not talking about Christians who all they want is tea and bread. That's not Christianity. There's actually no difference with due respect between that one and the man of the world. There's no difference. If it's all about tea and bread. Am I saying that tea and bread is not good? No. But you just imagine how frustrating life as a believer will be if it is always about what you can receive from God. Why don't we talk about who or what our responsibility now is in the kingdom because of what we have received. That's why a lot of Christians are frustrated when they are trapped in physical circumstances and conditions. And that's why God brought this message tonight as a healing and a reorientation to the body of Christ. Basic facts about God's dealings with men. I'll give you four and then we'll pray. Number one, well, some sentences are long, so you make sure you listen carefully to write. Basic facts about God's dealings with man or with men. Number one, Men are God's methods. Men are God's institutions upon the face of the earth. Those are two statements in one. These are facts. Alright? Basic facts in understanding the dealings of God with men. Number one, men are God's methods. I think it was E.M. Bounds who said that. Men are God's institutions upon the face of the earth. What is an institution? An institution simply is, an, you don't need to write that down, but you know, just for understanding's sake. An institution is an organization um, or an edifice that was established um, for, to acquaint society about a kind of knowledge. For instance, school is an institution where society can be acquainted with the knowledge that can make a man learned. Is that true? So when we say 
uh, a supermarket is also an institution. So there is a kind of knowledge that society can gain from every one of these institutions. Now we say that men are God's institution. So God is so vast and yet needs to be understood. He is infinite in his wisdom and his knowledge. Romans 11.33 tells us that the riches of his knowledge and his wisdom are great. Yet he needs to be understood. Because the only way man can function in accordance to divine purpose in his, is in understanding first his maker. So when God created man, he created men as institutions that will reveal different fragments of himself. That will bring or awaken in creation, what we call nature. That will awaken in creation and in nature the multifaceted wisdom of God. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3 in verse 10 that through the church might be made known to principalities and powers the manifold wisdom. Manifold means many-sided, multifaceted. It's so wide. It's like you enter a supermarket like in Meduguri here. Well, for us, we have two days. But people in other parts of Nigeria and even beyond, they have different kinds of they have shop right they have uh, you know different kinds of supermarkets you enter today's if you didn't if you didn't go with the intention to buy something you will find yourself strolling around for about five ten minutes because you are seeing everything that you need to see and you feel like picking everything there because daring is displayed a wide range of products from cosmetics to food items to house cleaning agents several things but in one building called a supermarket so also when god created man the intention for that design was that man will reveal the many side of the wisdom of god this invisible god that is great and powerful he will be made known in smaller fragments of knowledge through the institution called man that that's why you were designed that's why you were created so your life is meant to be lived as a revelation am i talking to somebody don't worry you listen to the message again men are god's methods you want to understand the plan of god the schemes of god how god does things it is embedded as a revelation in the life of men men so you go to a family generations before all of them stricken in poverty with all kinds of satanic curse and yoke and god goes to that family and raise a global multi-billionaire how that's the question men are god's methods so you, studying that guy's life will show you how god can pick someone from the dust he can pick a needy from the miry clay and set him among princes. What revelation is your life offering to your world? And for some of you, the revelation is ongoing. But it, you are, because of your haste, you are trying to spoil the work. You are trying to stop what is being made manifest. You know, light is appreciated more in darkness. Uh -huh. and that's why god allowed you to go through a level of shame because the glory that will follow will be better appreciated when there was a record of shame i'm talking to somebody so when you look around you and you see a man or a woman what you are looking at is a divine institution if that person is an unbeliever you are seeing an institution that has been abandoned. It's like an abandoned building project. It's still showing something, but in a, in a, in a corrupted state, in a crude state. 
But if that person is a believer and growing in the knowledge of God through Christ Jesus, which is in Christ Jesus, you are seeing an edifice that is emerging to produce a beauty. That's why seeking bread and tea as a believer alone is frustrating. When you do that, you reduce your life. You reduce the value of your life. So you are an institution, a divine institution on the earth. God wanted to explain revival for us in scripture. He did, he did it by using one word, Elijah. That's why in Malachi chapter 4, he said, Before the day of the Lord shall come, Elijah shall come and restore all things. He said, shall restore the heart of the father to the children and the children to the father. So before God begins a move on the earth, revival happens. You thought revival was the move of God. No. Revival is the protocol that prepares the way for the move of God. So signs and wonders, healings, miracles, all of those manifestations. is not what we call revival. That's not the move of God. That is the protocol that goes ahead to prepare the move of God is after all those things that a, a generation of people will arise in full expression of the life of God because they have grown in the knowledge of God that is in Christ Jesus. So their life now becomes an expression of that life. But that to happen, revival must come first. So God now picked a man and used his life to define a revival. That was why before the rain come, fire fell. On that sacrifice and the people knelt down and said the lord is god their hearts were restored back to god then god came in form of a rain and that's why in Hosea chapter 6 in from verse 1 to 3 he said let us return to the lord for he has torn us but he will heal us he said after two days he shall revive us on the third day he shall cause us to live in his sight he said let us pursue the knowledge of the lord his going forth is established as the morning for he will come to us as the rain he will come to us as the rain as the former latter on the earth so that rain that came was symbolic of divine visitation but before divine visitation is revival all of that he used the life of one man to explain it elijah that was why when that scenario need to happen again before jesus was manifested a man was sent from god john chapter 1 verse 6 he said there was a man sent from god his name was john in luke chapter 1 the bible says he shall go forth in the spirit and power of who men are god's methods god's institution if God wants to explain himself, he shows you the life of a man. That's why in your dream, especially when you are about to enter into certain seasons of life, certain people will come to you. Men are God's institutions. Now, when you have this understanding, you will treasure and honor one who is anointed of God. Because one who is anointed of God it's like a building that has been finished and certified by the engineers that is good for habitation. Then they now come and do a ceremony and open it. It is now dedicated for the use of a particular thing. So he has grown in the knowledge of God and his life has conformed to, to, in God to a point where there is a dimension of God that can be revealed through his life. Then God puts an endorsement on him. So anytime you see that face, whether in a dream or on Facebook or physically, anytime you see that face, it represents something. There are men in this country that if you see them, one word defines their existence. Prosperity. Wisdom. Influence. There are men like that. God brought you here tonight so that the process that will cause your life to become like that will be activated yeah. so you know why you are alive can we go on if i stay on this point we can preach to you tomorrow there are men that when you look at them all you see is the revelation of intense prayers that's what their life communicates 
if they pass you like this you feel like going to pray there are men like that there are men that when you see them you see signs and wonders anywhere they go one of such men was the great patriarch of faith in Nigeria Archbishop Benson Idaosa recently I was watching one of his videos he was sharing a testimony he went to preach in one of these African countries I think Uganda or so so they wanted to smuggle him through a door because people were clamoring to touch him and so the security told him we will use this door because they've already gone for this door here but the Holy Spirit told him use this door the security said no this one because there are people waiting there for in fact there's one blind and lame uh, 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 one blind and deaf cripple imagine that blind deaf cripple that she's waiting there for you let's use this door he said but the Holy Ghost said let's use this door here and as he passed there the woman began to ask where is he where is he where is he where is he and then somehow she meandered away and touched his suit and it was recorded it was carried on their national newspaper i think it's uganda or kenya instantly her eyes opened her ears opened she stood up on her feet and walked program has ended men are god's institutions there are men that can walk into your family all the prayer and fasting i've been doing for five years they can come and say peace be still and that's the end to every satanic cause it's as if the devil just vacates all the demons and say we'll come back another generation there are men like that in fact some of you are on under training now to become like that that's why you are going through all the all the said affliction that's why you are going through all the torment god will use your life as as it is now that you feel you find your life so uh, embarrassing you find it full of shame and reproach is there anything that can come out of your life there's something already coming out you are alive there are people better than you who died why do you think god left you alive there's something he wants to reveal there's a man called thomas edison the one who was given the patent for the invention of light bulb you go and read the history he did that experiment 1,000 times. It was the 1,000th time you got it. Imagine if he had given up at the 200th time. Some of you are in 700 now. And you want to give up. And that's why it's not everything you pray about that God will talk to you about. Some, he allows you to fail. Not because he hates you. But you are an institution. You are under construction. There's something that should be revealed. Everybody will pass, but you will fail. Not because he hates you. In fact, it's because of his great love. There's something he specially reserved your life to reveal. That's him there, Thomas Edison. And I think the story had it that he was a Christian. Him and Isaac Newton, they were Christian scientists. In fact, I was told Isaac Newton was <laughs> it was a virgin till his death. So who told you holiness is not is not possible in this present time? Who told you? It's not everybody that is running around like you. Without due respect. But I said you, I didn't say you know. You know that story that they asked the tortoise, what is your name? Say all of you. Let's, let's move on. Number two. That point one is enough for a whole month. Somebody say, I am God's method. Say, I am God's divine institution. On the face of the earth. To show forth His glory. That's what the Bible says. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, a holy nation, called out of darkness into his marvelous light. You were chosen to show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness to his marvelous light. The Bible says we are his building, his dwelling place. There's a song we used to sing those days. Lord, prepare me. A sanctuary Pure and holy Tried and true With thanksgiving 
I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Well, I have another version that I want to sing. Here's it. You have made me listen. A sanctuary. This is my own version. Pure and holy, tried and true. We thanks give. Listen to this. I am a living, not I will be. I am sanctuary. I am. I'm a living sanctuary. For you, I don't know about you, but if you see me, you don't need to look for God again. And I've deliberately positioned my life to continually reveal Him. That's a greater purpose. There's an ambience if you come around me, even a blind person knows that he has met heavy duty. Are you hearing me? In a bus, I still carry that consciousness. In a motor park where people are crazy up and down, I'm carrying that consciousness. In a bank, whether I'm dining with the rich or with the poor, I am constant with that consciousness that I am a sanctuary, a living sanctuary, a shrine. You know what happens when you go to a shrine? You can swear there and it will happen. And that means you can meet me and your desires become your manifestation. They did not say that before it shall come to pass. I was talking about a time of revelation in your work with God where before they call, I will answer. My life was created to bring the manifestation of that scripture. I don't know about you. And this is not something that you see. <laughs> this is uh, when it comes to these things, it's not something husband and wife can share. So a demon can go to a bed where husband and wife are lying down and press the wife and leave the husband. There are things we don't share in the kingdom. You have to awaken and arise with that light. I am a living sanctuary. Number two, God has always been known God has always been known to use human vessels. It's kind of long, but I'll, I'll be very slow so we can get it. Number two, basic facts about God's dealings with man. God has always been known to use human vessels. Excuse me. God has always been known to use human vessels who are seemingly unqualified. Who are seemingly unqualified. Seemingly is spelled seemingly. Seemingly unqualified. If you are here, say amen. amen. By human standards. Seemingly unqualified by human standards. So let me read it out for you to get it. God has always been known to use human vessels who are seemingly unqualified by human standards. Please be seated. God has always been known to use human vessels who are seemingly unqualified by human standards. I want you to think about that for a moment. God has always been known to use human vessels who are seemingly unqualified. Think about that. Remember where we are coming from. Number one, that men are God's methods. They are God's institutions. So, number two now is that God, He finds pleasure in using human vessels that are unqualified by human standards. I use the word seemingly because it appears that they are unqualified. But don't be fooled by the shell. The outer look. No. Why do you think they were looking for the strength of Samson? Do you really think Samson was muscular? Maybe he was like me. They won't look for his strength. If he was muscular, they will know that this one is a bodybuilder. 
He carries all kinds of kilo, and I think I want to start carrying very soon. Amen. I will employ you to be my coach. <laughs> Amen. That's why they were looking for his strength. Those children cursed Elisha because of his stature and his bare head. They didn't think that God would pick this kind of person as a prophet. You know, that's how a motorpark businessman looks. I hope you know, Elisha had nothing to do with the prophetic. He was doing his business in the farm, getting dirty with tractor and all of that. And Elijah came and casted the mantle on him and he followed. Unfortunately for these adults who were behaving like children, the reason why I said they were adults behaving like children was because children, if you look at the course, the, 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 the abuse they were rendering to Elisha, children cannot do that. Say, go away from here, you bald head. Who told them? Do you think children are that smart? And they were adults behaving like children. Unfortunately, they didn't know that this is a human vessel that seemingly looks unqualified. But something don't drop in the spirit. Oh. Something don't rest. I like God. It doesn't change the container. It leaves it like that. But the engine is Tesla. <laughs> then it deceives them. It makes you go back there and they think it's still the same you. Only for them to begin to see signs and wonders. They say, is this not Jesus of Nazareth? Whose brothers are James and his, these are his people there. And the Bible says they did not believe him. They insulting Elisha. Bad head. They didn't know that something had dropped. And Elisha cursed them in the name of God. Bears came out from nowhere and ate them. Don't be fooled by how the person looks. God is always in the business of using vessels that seem unqualified. He specializes in that. Because if the vessel looks strong... And God wants to reveal him stre his strength. He will take the glory for himself. He will say, my muscles brought it to me. He said, for the race is not for the swift, not the battle for the strong, nor bread for the wise man. He said, let, let the wise glory in his, his wisdom, nor the strong in his strength, or the rich in his riches. He said, but let him that glory, glory in this, that he knoweth and understands me. Jeremiah 9 verse 23 and 24. Jeremiah 1 verse 4 to 9. Let's see some few examples. Can I close here? Let's continue next week. I can't hear you. Okay, since you don't respond, I'll, let's continue next week. Let's pray here and go home. Eh? Should we continue? All right. Jeremiah 1, 4 verse 9. I want to read some of you. This is you. You will see yourself in this scripture now. He said, Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then this is you now. He said, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. For I am a youth. That's you now. That's what you've always been saying about yourself. That's why every time they give you something to do, you are always stepping by because you feel you are not able. So I'm showing you you. So that something can be awakened inside of you tonight. He said, but the Lord said to me, do not say. Or simply put, shut up. Don't say I am a youth. For you shall go to all to whom I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Go on. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. I love verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. That mouth that you say you can't speak. He said, it touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. God will touch somebody's mouth today. I'm telling you. Can I show you another version of you again? Exodus chapter 4. After today, if you, if you keep complaining, then you have agreed with God and heaven. That you, God, you made a mistake to have created me. Look for someone else. And that's a dangerous thing to say. Because God, after begging you for a while and you know greed, God will look for someone else, actually. 
But God forbid that God looks for someone else to carry my mandate while I'm alive. God forbid. My children have no right. Or they, my, they are permitted not to call me father if I'm alive and somebody else carries my mandate. Let them look for that person and call him their father. Because Papa no be just to give birth. There's an inheritance from God you will give to them. Where are we reading now? Exodus from verse 10. 4 verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, Can put your name there because that's you. I told you I'm showing you you. Oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent. But this one, his problem is that he cannot speak. He can speak, but he's not eloquent. I thought the Bible says Moses was mighty in words and deeds. In Acts chapter 7. Now that they now showed him his assignment is to go to Pharaoh, the wizard. He said, God, I, I, can't, I can't talk. Neither before, nor since you have spoken to yourself. What? <laughs> He's telling God that even this encounter I have with you, it didn't change my deformity. That's an insult now. You think about it. Is there a time God appeared to a man and something in that man didn't change? Now look at what Moses says. He said, neither before, nor even now that you have been talking to me, nothing changed. But I am slow of speech. That's what you said about yourself. I'm a slow learner, you know. That's why I can't pass this course. And slow of tongue. Let go on. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seen, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Let's go on. I love the scriptures. It's getting interesting. He said, Now therefore go with your slow mouth. And I will be with your mouth and teach you what you should say. That's what we call utterance. But he said, continuous complaining. May God deliver us from complaining. He said, oh my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. And that's what brought, gave Aaron ministry. God had no business with Aaron. Oh. I cannot, I cannot. And then he carved out May somebody know, there's a song we used to sing many years ago in my boarding school when I was in secondary school. I don't know if you can catch it. I will never let no stones to praise the Lord. I will never let no stones to praise. I will never let no stones to praise the Lord I will rise and take my right to thee many years in secondary school we used to sing it I will never left stones to praise God it's my right I was created to show forth his praises out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of your enemies to silence so god appears to you in your dream and tells you i'm going to raise you as a psalmist i'm going to raise you as a prophetic worshiper in your generation and i'm going to use you to reveal the throne room dimension of worship in this dispensation say god i cannot sing god is asking you who made the mouth this me that you i'm singing every day for you and you are enjoying the singing. There was a time somebody looked at me and said, Just stay with the instruments. You are not good as a vocalist. Said it to my face. But now that's the singing that people are listening to from different nations. More scriptures. Second, First Corinthians 1. God will always find pleasure in using human vessels that seem unqualified by human standards the reason why they look at you as unqualified or the reason why you look at yourself as you are not qualified is because you are judging based on the SI unit of men Abi, that's what they call the SI unit you are using men's definition how can you use 
is a standard of measurement that is finite and corrupt in itself how i shouldn't be preaching because many years ago i thought i was a drummer and i would have lived all my life thinking that my ministry will be in the drums not knowing that out of this frail container a voice to a generation will come verse 26 first corinthians 1 for you see your calling brethren that not many wise according to the flesh not many mighty not many noble are called but god has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise and god has chosen that's why you hear people like pastor chris delvan sing with the way he's singing you are glorious so glorious and you that have the best voice i don't know if there's any program that you will not find at least one of his songs sang on earth on earth globally i have not gone to a program a program where god came you at least one song from pastor chris delvan will come out but that's how it sings is the lord god almighty he said you know that not many wise not many strong not many mighty are called but god has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise and god has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty in fact in first samuel chapter 2 he said the bow of the mighty have fallen go on oh that's him there wonderful man of god and the best things of the world and the things which are despised god has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are why will god take pleasure in this that no flesh should glory in his presence so you that they kicked out and they rejected from that family god say give me give me i can use her come back for her in 20 years time and in 20 years time they can only see you on a billboard say ah, she's coming to this place today you are not an accident the way you are god loves you like that and he wants to use you like that forget about the things that are needed he is the all-sufficient god he said my strength is made perfect in your weakness that's what keeps you humble for him don't you realize that in the last three months that you have been broke financially you have been that's the most humble mo moments of your life no you check yourself you are growing in humility not it's not like that's the only way to be humble you can be rich and still be humble but there was no other way god could use and that humility is a virtue needed for what god will do for you in the future or through you how many of you know the nigerian footballer they call victor Osime? i don't really watch football but you know i study people who are great and making it in every field of life including satanist because some of the principles they use are in the bible you think satan will go and use somebody we don't know anything no you say that ah these all these musicians they are they are freemasons and don't you see they are talented victor Simon, and i was watching a documentary they did about him is he Osho the Abi? One of these ghetto places in Lagos. That was where he grew. They showed the field where he used to play football. Today, that guy is the number one star in Italy. Recently, I read that they, 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 they did something so that he can have one more year of contract because English clubs and Spanish clubs are looking for him. 
how would you say who would have known that god would go and pick a world star from that place when they saw when they showed the house he lived and where he slept i say kai if god can use this one me i'm, I'm a done deal some of them don't even know how to speak english but their money eh, if they put it in this house this house cannot contain it that no flesh should glory number three god qualifies those he calls by training i know you were looking for victor simon's picture right it's okay don't look for him <laughs> god qualifies those he calls by training building and equipping them his own way god qualifies those he calls by training building and equipping them his own way of course we have seen in number two that god almost always will use human vessels that seem unqualified yet he has his own way by which he qualifies them by building by training and by equipping what we call the dealings of god the making process of god you will need to really embrace that word process because every man that god will use to manifest his glory in a dispensation in a generation is a man that is familiar with process and sometimes the process is not too good in jesus case the bible says he was a man acquainted with grief and sorrows several levels of dealings of prunings of equippings he will not leave you ignorant like that yes he will use you as unqualified as you are but not the way you are he, will, he has his own way of improving this version of you what did he say in ezekiel let me show you how god does it chapter 36 verse 26 and 27 how does god make a man a vessel of clay into becoming a display of his glory he said i will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you that's salvation i will take the heart of stone out of your flesh this is your stubborn heart you give it to me i give it to you god says don't worry when i subject you to my process that give it to will disappear some of you may were more violent than this but look at your life now and give you a heart of flesh go on he said i will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them this is how god equips builds and trains men he subjects you to a process first of all by salvation he changes the heart that is in you he puts his spirit in you and then the spirit of god using the word of god as a compass begins to guide your dealings guide your actions guide your thoughts it's almost as if the old man is being purged out and then a new system of life is being forged inside of you you just give god time with that individual you just give god time with that murderer you just give god time with that prostitute you just give god time with that thief you just give god time with that liar just give him time what did the bible say of jesus luke chapter 2 verse 52 he says and jesus increased in wisdom and stature hold on jesus is the word of god jesus is the wisdom of god according to scripture yet the bible says he grew in wisdom how can wisdom grow in wisdom process somebody say process yes every one of us your life now is at one point of that process whether you believe it or not whether you are complying or not you are somewhere within that route the earlier you comply and hasten what god is doing the better for you god is going to give you an anointing that is so mighty that can do good and also destroy so he needs to work on that anger and he doesn't mind spending 10 years to work on it 
because if you carry that anger with the anointing, you become the, the latest nuclear weapon. Even North Korea don't have that one. Because anywhere you enter and they try you, you just lay course. Did you hear what Jesus told the disciples in the, in, in the gospel according to Luke? When they entered a, Samarian, a Samaritan city and the city refused to receive Jesus. They said, Master, let's call down fire. Say, we have been looking for how to express this power that we carry. Fire on them. Then they will know that you are Jesus. Jesus said, you don't even know the spirit you are carrying. God will give you an anointing and a glory that will make men almost worship you. So he needs to kill you. He needs to work on your humility. You heard what Peter did in Acts chapter 10 when he entered the house of Cornelius. The Bible says Cornelius fell on his face. What kind of a man is this that an angel will appear to me physically and say, send for Peter. This man must be a mighty man before immortals and men. He lay down. Peter said, no, stand up. I'm a man like you. But even as some of us today, you use them as foot mat. Say, so, yeah, yes, yes, I'm anointed. I'm anointed. They know how to honor people in this place. There's a difference between honor and worship. Let them hear so mighty things God is doing of you. But when they come around you, they can even, let it be that they can even pass you not knowing you are the one. Say, ah, now be this. Eh? Hey? Now be this. Now the apostle be this. Many times, some, myself and this, my guys, when we go out to preach, that's how we just enter the place like that and sit down. You know, everything is the way it is. In fact, remember, there was one outing, we, they, they sent somebody to pick us with a car. And the person was just talking and talking and talking. I, I can't put, but I remember there was a scenario like that. And just, no problem. When we entered the meeting and God showed up, when we were going by, the person kept quiet. By the last day of the meeting, the person came with seed. <laughs> so God will have to work on your humility. He's going to train you. He's going to build you. He will expose you to knowledge. You will need to know his will. You will need to understand him. Let him that glory, glory in this that he knoweth and understands me. No room for a novice. But you need to commit yourself. What did he tell them in Matthew chapter 4? Jesus talking to his first disciples that he chose. He said, follow me and I will make you. God is a maker. Better than any potter in this life. And where you are is one part of that construction. So you and the people around you should not give up on you. Somebody say, ah, I've tried. This particular thing I'm struggling with. How long will I continue? I've prayed, I've fasted, I've done this and that. And you are almost giving up. Just wait. Give God time. Give God time. It will be that your own deliverance will take a process. Because God will now use you to become an instrument of deliverance to everyone that will suffer from that particular perdition. Some of you pray for people and they get their healing instantly. But your own, you will have to see every stage of the recovery. You even need to take Panadol and add to it to be healed. And now you are looking at yourself as if you don't have faith. Can I tell you something? Just before we misunderstand scripture. Faith is the conviction you have about God's word. And his ability that does not change regardless of the outcome. If you believe that God is a provider and he provides, it does not change your faith. You will still keep believing that he's a provider. Even when he doesn't provide. Holding on to that conviction to death, that is faith. What conviction do you have about God in your life that you have held on to in the last 10 years? You can't even keep one conviction for one year. Because you think it's all about the outcome and the result. No. Is someone getting blessed tonight? 
Am I wasting your time? It qualifies the call. Allow him to work on you to make you. Job 33 verse 4 says, The Spirit of God is in me. The breath of the Almighty has given me life. He puts his spirit in you. He puts his wisdom in you. He makes you into the man that he has called you to be. And then finally, number four. God, in using men, comma, God, in using men, restores the original value or purpose for which they were made. God, in using men, restores the original value or purpose for which they were made. It is only God who knows your true and original purpose. And so when you allow God to use you, when you allow Him to take hold of your life, that is when your life will be used in accordance to its perfect purpose. Anytime a thing is not used according to why it was created, it is being abused. God is the only one that will possess your life and not abuse you. It restores the original value and purpose. All of a sudden you realize this is why I was born. Because now that it is God's business you are doing, there is a joy and a pleasure that you can't explain that surges from inside of you. Before now, you were used to getting joy, happiness, pleasure from outside. But because you are committed to God's cause, there is a joy that proceeds from inside of you like a well of living water. So you don't, you, you are not concerned whether you are you have much or you have little. As long as I keep doing this every day, it's like this is why I'm alive. Paul said in his words, he said, this one thing I do, it restores the original value. You know that this is the reason for why you were born. Jesus said, for this purpose came I into the world. It's only God that can use you. The devil will play you, play you, play you to destruction. The devil will only want to take advantage of the gifts and the fabrications of God inside of you. Use it to adorn his kingdom and after that discard you as tissue paper. That's what he does. That's what he does to people who do rituals to get money. People who do rituals for Yahoo. It looks like the easy way. <laughs> but let me tell you something. You will discover that it will be one ritual after another. I mean, you think of it. For some, it tells them eat human feces. That's dehumanizing. How can you reduce God's priceless possession to that? That's what the devil, every time you are doing business with the devil, watch the actions. He's insulting you in the process. And it's not just you, he's insulting God. So when you are eating human feces with bread, in the name of you want to do Yahoo Yahoo to get money because you are tired of 15 years of poverty. Unknown to you, God is mock, devil is, the, you know, the devil is mocking God in the spirit. Say, that's you. That's you. In your image and your likeness, that's you. Eating poop. Oh, you don't know that's how it is? Then you kill this one and then you enjoy a level of financial, you know, explosion. Later on, you discover that you can't sleep. They will tell you, you need to kill another person. Kill your mother this time so that you can sleep and have the money. You kill your mother, you sleep now. But in your dream, somebody is pursuing you. They say, kill your only sister. By the time you get to the end of that chain, you, he, has made, he has turned you into a murderer. And there's this guilt inside of you. You will almost not believe that God can still save you. You have brought yourself into eternal condemnation while alive. You know the next thing? Suicide. I, I don't care how long God, God's way is. I will wait. It's better than that one. It's better than that one. The Bible says better is little with peace than a fatted cow skill with strife. What kind of haste are you into? There's a difference between haste and speed. There's a difference between growing up and jumping up. If you jump, you will come down. But grow. Only God restores the original purpose, the original value. So you are sleeping in that boy's house. Why? Because he's paying your school fees. 
because he's giving you little little stipends to survive in school and so you now think he's your provider he's your benefactor he's everything that's why you can't come out of that disgusting relationship that has reduced you to a a bad woman a harlot but i came to tell you come out of it i don't care even if the man is here now listening to us come out of it who told you that god cannot provide for you was that what you were created for to be someone's pleasure tool joseph told potiphar's wife free food oh. bishop free food chop the master's wife came and said lie with me free food you know go chop joseph said why will i do this wickedness before god this was not the original intention god had this was not the sun moon and stars i saw myself bowing to i will not give into this that's why the bible says godliness with contentment is great gain you don't you don't you don't allow the devil ridicule ridicule your life and turn it to a mess look at what he's already doing in your life Take it up by four. I want to sing a song. God is the one, the only one that restores the original purpose. When He takes hold of you and He begins to use you, there's something He does with your life that tells everybody that this is why this one came to the world. And in that state, He becomes your provider, He caters for you, He takes care of you. The Bible says that the, the, the birds in the air neither sow nor reap. He said, but your heavenly father takes care of them. How much more are you who live two feet? Jireh, you are enough. Jireh, you are enough. Sing it four times. Jireh, you are enough. Say, Jaira, you are enough. Jaira, say, Jaira, you are enough. You're more than enough for me, God. Jaira, you are enough. Strings, I will be content. In every circumstance, Shira, you are enough. Hold on, let me minister to somebody. Play strings. I want to minister to somebody with this part of the song. You have been feeling rejected and discontent where you are. I want to know that you have more than enough with you. Just listen to this. I won't be content. In every circumstance, I will be content. In every situation, I will be content. In every problem around me, I will be content. In every face of hunger, I will be content. In every circumstance, Jaira, you are enough. Listen to me. What is more important in my life now is what I'm doing. Oh. It's not any of the things that I can acquire. I love those things and I know God will bring it. I was not here before. But to think that I will exchange this for anything, put a pistol on my head and pull the trigger. I'm telling you. Even if that gun points at me now, I'm ready to die. Oh. Let me just tell you the truth. But there's no difference. You see, my being on earth here, eh, I'm, at the same time, I'm in the heavens. The Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. You kill me, you only set me free. But I will exchange this for any other thing. God forbid. How do they say God forbid in Hausa? This is my conviction. 
What's your conviction? Stand up, let's pray. I will be content in every set, even with the carryover. I will be content in every circumstance. Listen to me. Contentment is different from satisfaction. You are not satisfied that there is more you can get, but you are content even with this one. That's why Job will say, All the days of my appointed time, I will wait. No need to fast track what whatever it is. I will be content. Let me let me prophesy. Every circumstance, I will be content in every situation. I will be content in every trouble around me. I will be content when all hope seems but lost. I will be content without a job for 10 years. I will be content even when I am failing. I will be content in every circumstances. Jire. Open your mouth and talk to God. Open your mouth and talk to God. Open your mouth and talk to God tonight. Open your mouth and talk to God. You were chosen for a specific divine purpose. And this purpose must be your pursuit. You were set apart for a divine purpose. You are God's method. He uses you even when men look down on you. Even when you seem unqualified by human standards. Yet he trains you. He equips you. He builds you. He qualifies you his own way. And he restores the original purpose for your creation. Come on, talk to God, somebody. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that set themselves against me round about. I lay me down and I sleep and I won't. I won't fall. Many are they that be that troubles me. Many are they that rise up against me. Many are they that say of me there is no help for him. There is no help for him. God. Just talk to him tonight from what you have heard. Let there, let there be a prayer that rises from inside of you. And know tonight that you were specifically chosen. God has picked you out of a generation. You are single out of a thousand for a divine purpose. And those that he called, he justified. Those that he justified, he glorified. 
You set the sea so I can walk right through it. My feet are planted on this road. You rescued me so I can stand and share my child of God. You split the sea so I can walk right through it. My feet are planted on this road. You rescued me so I can stand and say. Sharabara de Bukosuka, Epabos, Sabara, your life is in his hands. 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 Parandos Capilata, Penda Cupa, the Panda Cosca Palapata, Shape Pepe Pepe Capa Patu Capata, Eshape Pepe 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 for joy comes in the morning, troubles they don't last always. But there's a friend named Jesus who will wipe your fears away. And if your heart is broken, just lift your hands and say, Let's testify again. You don't have to worry. And don't you be afraid. Joy, 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 joy comes in the morning. Troubles they don't last away. But there's a friend named Jesus. If your heart is broken, if your heart is broken, just lift your hands and say, lift your hands Let this be your testimony. Oh, I know that I can make it. Shapa raga deaga. My God, I feel an anointing.
it to yourself. No matter what comes my way. I'm a man on a mission. I'm a man sent here for divine purpose. God is working on me. And until he's done, I will not give up. Come on, somebody prophesy to yourself. Prophesy against that fear. Prophesy against that depression. Prophesy against that low self-esteem. It doesn't matter what you don't have now. But it will matter when God is done with you. your village no matter what you throw at me my life is in until it's done no witch has a power right against you no one absolutely no one your life is in his hands Father, we give you glory tonight. Thank you for this word. In the name of Jesus, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. From today, let a new chapter in your destiny and in your work with God be opened now. The reason why a new chapter must open is because that is the beginning of another phase and there's something interesting about the beginning the bible says in the beginning god when god when something new happens in your life you have begun with god on another scale and in the name of jesus i declare over your life your destiny and your work with god a new chapter is open today i speak against every form of fear doubts every trouble of the enemy around you low self-esteem depression discouragement everything that the enemy has launched at you in the name of jesus it is swallowed up by the revelation of god's purpose it is swallowed up by the revelation of god's purpose walk in the light of this revelation let your life become an unending flow of wonders and of signs Go through the process with grace. Strength to endure is released upon you. And those of you who have endured for a while, may the Lord perfect you. May the Lord establish you. May He strengthen you and settle you. In Jesus' mighty name, shout a big amen.